Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have an hour and a half in front of us. The Lord willing, we'll have all that time to talk about the Bible. Nothing is more important than the Bible because it comes from the lips of God himself. God, who is the infinite creator of the world, who is from everlasting past, who rules as the supreme ruler over everything. Oh, my, we can't say enough good things about God because there is no nobody that compares with God. There's nothing we can compare uh, with God. He is His eternal majesty and uh, deserves all the praise and the glory and uh, the wonder of our lives and uh, uh, the very fact that He has given us His words so that we have some knowledge of what He has done and who He is that in itself is an enormous blessing. But this is your program. Now we want to take our first call on our telephone lines. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Kevin. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. Uh, I have a question, actually. This is identified by my son. Uh, uh, when we were reading uh, the Genesis uh, after the flood, uh, after... Noah comes out of the ark. Uh, the first thing he does is uh, gives the uh, sacrifices of the uh, clean animals uh, uh, of every kind. So, my, you know, my son asked me, you know, is it that uh, he got additional animals than the two of each kind, or uh, how did it happen? Oh, well, the fact is that uh, we read earlier on that when the animals, when God commanded him that the animals should be put on the ark, there was one pair, a male and a female, of all the unclean animals and seven pairs of the clean animals because the clean animals were used for food and for sacrifice. So there were actually 14 uh, 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 beef cattle and 14 lambs and 14 goats and 14 uh, of, the, of the various uh, the, the few clean animals that did exist and that was that meant that when the ark uh, when he went out of the ark he had animals to sacrifice but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping. Yes. I have a question. Um, did Noah, Moses, and the people then um, aware of how old they were each year as they lived out their lives, or did God just record their ages in the Bible just to establish the timeline of... Oh, well, those people knew a passage of time. They... They were intelligent people, just like the people today are intelligent. There's uh, quite a few intelligent people in the world today. And uh, they uh, they would have, uh, God told Noah, you have 20, 120 years in, in order to build the ark. And so they kept track of the passage of time, just as we do today. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campy. Yes. I have one question, and it deals with uh, the fact that when when we are saved or not saved. Yes. What is your okay, question? When you said that the, when when we die, if we're not saved, we are dead. I understand that. When you said that when we when we are saved, and, and if we go to heaven. Okay, and be with God for the new new heaven and new earth, that we will not remember and it will not be brought to mind our former life. So what is the difference of whether we live or whether we die? I know you tried to answer this once before, but I'm depressed about this issue. Well, the fact is that this world is the egg, the total um, experience of 
people who God did not save. They live uh, for whatever years or months or days that they live. They can die as a baby or they can die a hundred years old today or in times past they lived to be as older than 900 years or near the beginning of time. And uh, this was their total experience and then they died and uh, if they were not saved and uh, and that was the end of them. They never, never came to conscious existence again. On the other hand, if you're a true believer, because we are... That, now, let me say ahead of time now for a moment that every human being it consists of two very distinct parts. We have a body like a body of an animal and we have the breath of life. And we have a spirit essence called a soul. And the animals don't have a soul. But the soul of man is just as real a part of his personality as his body is. And when an unsaved man dies, he is dead soul and body. He is completely dead. He'll never again have conscious existence in any part of his life. But on the other hand, when a person becomes a child of God, it, and there's no change in his body uh, that will continue to lust after sin as he had been doing in soul and body before God saved him. But when God saves him, God gives him an eternal soul in which he never wants to sin again and in which he will never die. So when he dies physically, he's just like the unsaved. His body is put in the tomb. But in his soul existence, he goes to live and reign with Christ in heaven. And uh, he has an, one more part of his salvation that has to be completed. And that is it is guaranteed that at the end of the world, he'll also receive a new body his body that was put in the grave will be resurrected whatever part of it is still left it might only be dust or ashes or 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 uh, atoms uh, whatever is left and it'll be resurrected an eternal spiritual body in which he will uh, join with his eternal soul in which he had been living in heaven already and will be with Christ forever more and uh, but he'll never remember uh, come in this present world will never come into mind once he's with Christ in heaven both body and soul all right thank you sir and you have a great evening Th thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we have our next call please welcome to open forum yeah hello um, Howard um I have a question. I'm kind of confused here. Um, you say that uh, the great tribulation, the tribulation of uh, the second one um, with the nation of Judah, started um, with the death of Josiah. I think it was. Um, now, in the book of Jeremiah, it says something about. Uh, I believe it's uh, the chapter 29. I think it is. Where it says, I'm in my car right now, so I can't look it up. Um, it says something about the 13th year of Josiah until now, um, and it says about the tw it's a 23rd year. So does the, does the tribulation start on his well, death or the 13th of his, of his Josiah, year? Josiah, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 23 years he was 31 years no let me see he no he reigned for 31 years and he was 39 years old when he died and that marked that was in the year 609 bc and that marked the beginning of the great tribulation for the nation of judah and the nation of israel uh, for the next 70 years they were in bondage or harassed and, and, and during that period the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed 
and uh, and that came to an end finally in the year 539 B.C. when uh, those who were still alive in Babylon and there were about 50,000 people that returned to Jerusalem that marked the end of their great tribulation. What does it mean um, when Jeremiah says uh, it's 23 years, it's the 23rd year? Well, what, what is the reference, please? For, what is the reference? Uh, uh, I, like I said, I'm in my car, I can't Well, I'm sorry, right you'll, you'll have to find that. Uh, uh, the uh, I'm not a, I'm not f familiar with that particular verse. It may be, but I I'm not fam familiar with it. The fact is, it was he he was 39 years old when he was killed in battle. From more, as far as I recall it. Okay, thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Campion, good evening. Yes. I'm calling because I was once a member of the Mormon Church, and as far as I was told, I think, the Book of Mormon was the account of Christ's travels uh, in the Americas while he was here on Earth. To your, to your knowledge, did Christ ever come to the Americas? Absolutely not. The Book of Mormon was written by Joseph Smith, it has nothing to do with, with the being the Word of God. It is, has no truth in it, if, if whatever it is, has to say about the historical record of anything connected with what is being taught in the Bible. It is, uh, it is uh, uh, Christ, there's, no, there's, not, there's just not a figment of truth in all of that. Oh, okay. My other question is, uh, according to what you say about the last day, the uh, October 21, 2011, what will happen to Satan? Oh, he's when going to be destroyed, annihilated, right along with all those who would still be alive who are unsaved. On uh, October 21 is the end of the day of judgment, and it is the time when the whole universe will be annihilated and never, never, never. Uh, come into existence again or be remembered anymore. And after that, there will be peace and paradise? Is, is that what's going to happen? Uh, well, paradise is heaven, and there's uh, the true believers will be with Christ, and there is no, uh, no uh, sin in heaven, in the new heaven, in the new earth. Uh, there is no... Uh, uh, the, <laughs> When you say peace, the reason that that uh, God uh, talks about Christ being the Prince of Peace is because He is the one who reconciles rebellious men and women to God Himself, uh, and uh, by by paying for their sins. And but in heaven, in the new heaven and the new earth, there is no sin. Uh, there are things like peace are not even mentioned because it's it's it is the very essence of peace forevermore. I see. Okay. Thank you very much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey brother, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. Um thank you for that last call but uh here you put that out there about the war is because that's the absolute truth. Um I just have, my question is, um, could you please explain to uh, myself and all the callers about the Sabbath? I, I'm um, sorry, could you, uh, could you speak up a little bit more? Can I explain about the Sabbath? Yes, uh, the, I'm, I'm uh, stuck on Saturday and uh, as being the seventh day. And, uh, well, and you I see, just, uh, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath that was observed, and the Sunday Sabbath, they didn't know anything about that. God didn't talk about that. But the seventh-day Sabbath, uh, that was a ceremonial law that on Saturday they were, uh, and actually it went from sundown on Friday until sundown on Saturday, uh, they were not to do 
any work of any kind, the reason being, like we read about in Exodus chapter 31, the reason being that it was a picture, a portrait, a representation of the fact that we are not to do any work of any kind thinking that we can somehow help us get saved. Uh, that somehow we can do a little tiny bit of work to re assist in getting ourselves saved. That's an absolute impossible. And so God declared in Exodus chapter 31, where he says in verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. Those are the seventh day Sabbath. For it is a sign. Now it is a sign. That is, it is a portrait. It is a representation. It is a, a pointing to something. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am Jehovah that doth sanctify you. And to be for him to sanctify us means to save us. And it's for, in other words, it's a sign uh, indicating, now don't think for a moment that anything you can do can help you become saved. It is all the work of salvation is done by God. As a matter of fact, it is so serious. He goes on, God goes on in verse 14 of Exodus 31. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For all whosoever doeth any work thereon, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh it is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jehovah. Whosoever does any work on that Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. You notice how God is driving home the point. This is not an incidental small matter. This is deadly serious. And when we go back to uh, Numbers chapter 15, we read there about a man who picked up a few s sticks on the seventh day Sabbath. And when Moses asked God, what shall we do to this individual? God said, stone him to death. He is to die, and they stoned him to death because he is a picture of someone who says, who believes, well, you know, the reason I am saved is because I believed on Christ. That's a work. That's like working on the seventh-day Sabbath. The reason I, that what has helped me become saved is when I was baptized in water. That's a work that we do, and such a person is guaranteed that he is not saved. I am saved because, you know, I made confession of faith. Uh, and, uh, and again, it, uh, it is, uh, or I repented of my sins, or I did this, or I did that, that all helped me become saved. And in every case, uh, those kind of people are guaranteed to end up at the judgment throne because they have violated what God is teaching here in this in the, in the setting of the seventh-day Sabbath. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Dr. Camping. Yes, go ahead with your call. Uh, yes, I'd like for you to... i better turn down my radio. Pardon me for a minute. I'm sorry, would you... Re what is your question? Oh, you're turning down your radio? Yes, pardon uh, me for No, what thing. is your question? My question is, um, my question isn't a question. I'd like you to read Deuteronomy 32, um, chapter 32, 35 through 37. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 to 37. There like we read... I'd like you to explain it um, thoroughly, and I'll hang up um, right now. Thank you. Yes. Till we, uh, to me belong the vengeance, God is saying, 
and recompense their foot shall slide in due time let me pick up the context here um, Uh, he's talking here about the unsaved. He's saying in verse 32, their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of asps is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures to me belong the vengeance. Now, he's been talking about those who are in rebellion against him, those who are unsaved. And I and God is saying that he has the right uh, to uh, bring punishment, uh, and their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. That's a figure of speech that they can't stand because they are in rebellion against God and will come under judgment. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. For Jehovah shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. Now, actually, the judgment process, uh, we have to know from the rest of the Bible. We can't tell it from these verses at all. But the judgment process is that the moment a person breaks the law of God, that is, he commits a sin, the wages of sin is death. He breaks the law of God, and the law immediately uh, is acting as the judge. It finds that person guilty and pronounces a sentence against that person. You're going to die for this sin. And that's what a judge does. And so this... Uh, uh, when it says here, the Lord shall judge his people, that is going on from the moment that that person is born, and every time there is a sin, and in the life of an unsaved person, there's an enormous amount of sins that, uh, so that he is constantly under the judgment of God. On the other hand, if you're a child of God and you sin, uh, then that sin has already been paid for by Christ, and so uh, you're not threatened by the wrath of God any longer uh, uh, because Christ has already made that payment. And so uh, that, and then this passage ends, uh, uh, and he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Uh, Who's going to protect them? Who's going to make payment for their sins? There is nobody. And so they are, they are, uh, uh, they are under the, for certain, under the wrath of God. Now the phrase, there is none shut up or left. I, uh, 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 I, I believe that this has to do with in another passage, it, it, it is tr the same kind of language is translated. There is no helper. They have no one to assist them. There's no one uh, that uh, is left uh, that can help them in, in uh, their terrible predicament of being under the wrath of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, I had a question. I was wondering when you were talking about, like, the end of days that we're in now, that Satan is ruling the churches? Yes. So if you go to church and, like, if you're going there for the social or things like that, or if you're tithing, you're saying you're, like, tithing to Satan? Oh, well, yes, you are. You are. He is the ruler, and you are really... Uh, worshiping him or oh, you're you're convinced you're worshiping God because uh, worshiping Christ because he is the great deceiver he's the father of lies and he has deceived you but if you read second Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 11 God gives a description of that where he says Satan will uh, is is like an angel of light and his ministers 
like ministers of uh, righteousness, and they are that's the character of the churches in our day. Good work, like they hand out food and stuff, even to volunteer, that would be wrong? Or are you saying just to go there to um, worship? Uh, well, is going there to worship is wrong because you can't, because Christ is not there to be worshipped. He, uh, he is not there to save anybody. He has turned the ruling of the churches over to Satan. And so whether you are connected with the church in any way you are are uh, working for satan you're worshiping satan it's the last place in the world where a true believer would ever want to be that's why the bible tells us to get out get out uh, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place and that's the churches are called the holy place because uh, that's where the Bible has been for 1955 years of the duration of the church age. But now get out, because uh, who wants to worship Satan? That's the worst thing we could do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Family Radio, Mr. Camping and listeners. Yes. I'd like to make a quick statement and then ask you a question, if I may. Go ahead. Thank you. My statement is that you, sir, are a false teacher, and Ezekiel chapter 14 lays out your fate. Secondly, my question is, will Family Radio be up for sale very cheaply, and I'm serious, on May 22nd next year? Well, the fact is that uh, it's your judgment that that family radio is teaching false doctrines, and that means that they're, we're teaching something that you do not agree with, and either you or we are false, uh, and and you, in your judgment, you think we are the false people. Well, the test is not what you or I think. The test is what does the Bible teach? And I can tell you what will be happening on May 22. It'll be the second day of the Day of Judgment. It'll be horror, horror beyond measure. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Brother Camping. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you and your staff for doing an excellent job. I I'm sorry, your voice is way down, and, but now go ahead with your call. I want to thank you and your staff for doing an excellent job in lifting up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a question uh, pertaining to Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 5. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Behold, the day of Jehovah cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall Jehovah go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And Jehovah, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now, these, this is a, a very, very difficult passage, but it is talking about Judgment Day and just what happens just before Judgment Day. Notice that the focus is on division, division, division. The uh, well, first of all, it talks about the Day of Jehovah, and that's that is Judgment Day that God has in view, 
and all that happens just before and just uh, when the day of judgment does occur and uh, and it I get, will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle it uh, first of all the uh, Satan has uh, be, uh, is uh, installed in the in the churches uh, during that uh, great tribulation period that is just in front of the day of judgment and he is of course the antagonist against the true gospel altogether uh, typified by the word Jerusalem here uh, which is another uh, name for ex externally representing the kingdom of God and Satan is out to destroy if he possibly can but then notice the division the, the uh, half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city and then uh, and uh, his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a great valley and uh, half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south you see, it's during the Great Tribulation when judgment does begin. It begins uh, upon all the churches and the nation of Israel that, uh, that uh, has come back into existence at, right at our time. And, uh, and uh, there is a, 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 a dividing of the true believers from anyone who claims to be a believer. Uh, the number of true believers is very, very tiny by this time in the churches, and maybe none in the maybe very, very tiny in the nation of Israel. But the, they, there will be that division, and the true believers will be uh, taken out of the churches and out of the, out of any contact with the. Uh, the religion of the Jewish people, and and the, the only everybody else is left because they are there waiting for judgment. And this is really and it when when it says here that Christ will come and stand on the Mount of Olives, that's a figure of speech that he's come to bring judgment. He is the ruler to bring judgment. Has to be done by the one who is the ruler. And uh, and so this is uh, Zechariah 14 is introducing us again in very difficult language to the very period of life, a time which we are in right now. We're within a year of the of uh, the end of the day of of the of the great tribulation. We're only a year and a week away from the day of judgment. And so what's talking about here in Zechariah 14 uh, is spiritually going on, going on right now. Thank you, Brother Camping. Uh, may I ask another question, please? Yes. Okay, let's go to jo uh, Jonah, chapter 3, verse 7. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 7. Let's look at that, Jonah, chapter 3, verse 7. Uh, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. This is the king. When Jonah came there and began to preach that in 40 days God was going to destroy the city of Nineveh, that wicked Assyrian city, and, uh, and the king uh, took it very seriously, and he sat in sackcloth and ashes and also commanded everybody in the nation to sit in sackcloth and ashes. He published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Now, when he talks about beast, uh, he's not talking about a, a uh, cow or a, a, uh, a dog or a cat or something like that. This is a figure that God is using uh, that the believers are typified by lambs and goats and cattle. And, and uh, uh, God is uh, uh, complicating the language here. But uh, the fact is that everybody uh, 
uh, every human being in the city of Nineveh was sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Some remember in uh, John 10, Christ says that I am the good shepherd and you are my sheep and the sheep follow me. And that's the idea of the word beast here. I would like to compare that to two other passages. One is Proverbs 9, verse 17 and 18. Well, thank you for calling. Oh, pro oh you have one more, Proverbs 9, verse like 17. Yeah, Proverbs 9. All right, we'll look at that a moment. Proverbs 9, verse 17 and 18. There we read, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell that is they are faced uh, hell has to do with the grave they are facing gra the grave uh, and uh, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant that is those this is talking about sin sin People don't sin because it's a horrible experience. They sin because I like that. This uh, pleases me. And uh, and uh, the more they get accustomed to sin, uh, certain sins, there are sins that are very distressing. But on the other hand, there are many sins that are very pleasant to the unsaved. And, uh, and yet they are... Uh, indicating by their enjoyment of that sin that they're on their way to eternal death, to be, de be dead forevermore. Uh, that's why it talks about they're already in the depths of hell. Thank you. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, Mr. Camping, can you go to... Luke 18, um, 41, 42. Luke 18, verse 41 and 42. There we read. Uh, uh, let's, let's start with verse 40. And Jesus stood and commanded him. Uh, okay, we got to back up a little more. Uh, we read um, about uh, a blind man. And in verse 38, when he heard that Christ Jesus was passing by, he cried out, saying, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. Okay, now the question is, Whose, what does that mean? Thy faith has saved thee. We know that it's not the man's faith because faith can't save anybody. That's a work that we do. But whose faith is it that saves us? It is Christ. He is, in other words, Christ. He, because he, uh, it is Christ who has, has made the payment for his sins. It is his faith. That made it, that he would, obviously this individual was one of God's elect, whom God had already saved or already had made the payment for his sins before the foundation of the world, and now it's it is typified by him receiving his physical sight, but probably at the same time he was also given his eternal soul, in which he would never want to sin again. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, uh, Mr. Camby. I have a, uh, a question 
about May 21st, 2011. And then I have a, um, a, a, a comment about the Bible that you study out of. My, my comment is, when May 21st comes, um, should it, shouldn't you be um, letting the whole world know as far as what's going to happen the day before so that you have airplanes, you have families traveling across country? Uh, I, excuse me, you're asking me to do something that the Bible doesn't give us any information about except the Bible says, occupy until I come. Uh -huh. And uh, therefore, that word occupy till I come has to do with getting on with the business of warning the world uh, uh, about the impending judgment day and telling the world the glad news that, that uh, until Christ comes, there is the possibility of salvation. And so, right. as far as I'm concerned, that's what's going to go on in family radio right up until the last moment we're going we're taking that verse very very seriously occupy till i come could you did you, could you give a, a reference of where that's found uh, occupy till i come yes sir yeah it's in the gospel of luke but i don't remember the verse i'm sorry i uh, uh someone will be calling believe i'm sure and give us the verse where it is found Okay, we'll look that up. One other thing I had, I've been listening to you for years now, and I, I, I love family radio. I love the, 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 the morning, Saturday morning, Christian. I love the doctors to come on and talk about the, the diabetes. I mean, it's just the, the music, everything is just so spiritually um, well put together. Um, but one thing I find that a lot of people who are, who are trying to follow you uh, when you are uh, you go and you you try to you quote you read scripture and then you interpret scripture, but we try to follow you in our own Bibles here at home. Okay, maybe you might want to suggest the Bible that you use so that we can follow you. For instance, I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking at my I, okay. I, I, read I, out I, my I understand your problem. I understand your problem. Now, one thing I do. And it's not, it is whenever I see the word Lord in the Old Testament with all four letters capitalized, I know that, that in the Hebrew that uh, we should pronounce that either Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, it is not Lord. Uh, that has been placed there because the translators uh, are following what the Jews have always done. They didn't want to use the holy name of God. And so they, whenever they saw the name Jehovah, they said the word Lord. And, uh, and our King James Bible, in fact, every Bible, or almost every Bible that you can, fi that you can find, you'll find that, the, that it says Lord with all four letters capitalized. And yet I always read it Jehovah. And so that, uh, I, I admit that that makes it a little bit to sound like I'm reading from a different Bible. I'm really not at all. I'm reading from the King James Bible, just substituting uh, the word Lord for Jehovah. And uh, uh, once in a great while, I'll get tempted and I'll see a passage where the translation is wrong and I will read it. Uh, uh, the, way, the way it ought to be corrected and I shouldn't do that without warning our listeners because it's not fair to them uh, and that it sounds like I'm reading from another Bible I'm not, I'm reading from the King James Bible and thank you for uh, offering that uh, question or that suggestion or that uh, uh, problem and now shall we go to our next call, please. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. I wonder if you would explain Revelation 20:10, please. In Revelation 20, verse 10. Let's look at that. In Revelation 20, verse 10, we read, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented, day and night 
not forever and ever. The context will not permit that. Uh, it's a preposition that's translated for in our King James Bible, but it should have been translated to ever and ever. Uh, so that it's saying, and shall be tormented day and night to ever and ever. Now, the during the day, the day of judgment, which is a we know from Revelation 9 is a is a five month period, actually 153 days from May 21 till October 21. During that period, uh, Satan, and it talks here about the the beast and the false prophet. That ties back into Revelation 13, where Satan is first presented as a beast that comes out of the sea, and then he's presented as a as a false prophet that comes out of the earth, but it's still Satan. It is still Satan. And so, however, uh, we have looked upon Satan, whether we've looked at him as a beast or a dragon or the devil or a false prophet, the fact is Satan in every aspect of his being is in the is in the day of judgment, uh, which is called a, a uh, here in this verse, uh, uh, a lake of fire, because God is a consuming fire, and he is tormented there uh, for that 153 days till two, because during that 153 days, there's no change in the sun or the moon or the stars, uh, the universe is still going along the same. That has not changed at all. That will all come to an abrupt end. It will all be annihilated on the 153rd day of the day of judgment. And, and at that point, at that point, everything is done. It's, everything is annihilated. There's no longer any universe. There's no devil. There's no unsaved. There's no. There's nothing. It's all gone, and nothing will ever, ever be come into remembrance again. It has. It has all been annihilated. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, brother. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would just like to say to all the listeners out there that it. it they would uh, serve it best if they uh, read their Bible very carefully and pray earnestly with a contrite heart that they may, uh, the Holy Spirit may re reveal to them what God is saying through His Word. Now, I've been listening to you since 92, and the Holy Spirit, had, through God's Word, had taught me things that I thought that I had arrived on my own. But then I started listening to you in 92, and I praise God because it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit that told me everything. Well, excuse I, me. Excuse me. What is your question? <laughs> Are, well, it's it, the question. It's just that I was glad that I wasn't the only one who was reading the Bible and, and coming up with these things that the churches were not teaching. Well, in other words, uh, 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 have you you believe that God the Holy Spirit, as you have diligently read the Bible, has given you a lot of different doctrines than what you hear on family radio? And staying uh, for myself, I thought that I was coming up with these things on my own, and then I, then I, then somehow I, I can't remember because it's been you know since '92 how I found family radio, but I found family radio. And I heard you saying the exact same things, teaching the exact same things that I had studied in my Bible for myself and came to understand. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that, that, of course, truth is, is only one piece. It, it, truth is not a, uh, offering several different ideas about the same subject. Uh, truth is, is always one. It's, uh, when you come to truth, it is, uh, it, it, it isn't fragmented. It is very, very, very solidly truth. And it will be in harmony with everything else that is true that we've learned from the Bible. And uh, But you are correct that the individual listeners should also diligently read the Bible. And, and one way to make progress is 
when you hear things on family radio. Don't trust me, whatever you do. But look at what we've talked about at the verses in the Bible and see once if that is what you can understand that is being said. And, and of course, God will open the spiritual eyes of those who are true believers. He will not open the spiritual eyes of those who are not saved. Uh, they will not understand. They will read the same material, and they won't be able to come up with, with the same conclusion at all because God just has not opened their eyes. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, would you kindly clarify a couple things for me, please? Yes, what verse is it? Um, well, uh, the f uh, first question, you know the verse. It's, it's about Elohim um, created Adam in their image and likeness holy and perfect but adam disobeyed god falling into sin aren't all of his progeny including us created in his fallen image and likeness and since he was initially perfect wouldn't he have been saved like you said Job, for example was saved because uh, you are asking an impossible question i am okay <laughs> let's go to the next question then um, how can we be heirs of God, the Father, and joint heirs with Christ when the Father isn't dead? Well, if if the the fact is the true the people of the world are not heirs of God, they are uh, they are uh, sons of Adam and Eve. The whole human race comes from the bloodline of Adam and Eve. And we are only we only become heirs of God when God has purchased us by by paying for our sins, and that's only the true believers. And it, 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 uh, as an Adam, all uh, all sin, uh, all die, but in Christ shall all that is all who are who Christ has paid for will be made alive. And then when we're when we are adopted into the family of God, as we read in Romans chapter 8, and that happens when we become a true believer, then we become heirs of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, we become, uh, inherit, we inherit the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, so it's not like in, in real life where, let's say, the father has to die, become deceased, in order for his family to inherit his possessions. Well, yes, in order to be an heir, it means that our Heavenly Father, who is Christ, He is the Eternal Father, and He had to die. He did die. Uh, he, he had to be, he made, He's the maker of the will uh -huh. that, the, uh, uh, that declares that, that uh, there would be an inheritance, and, uh, and, and until He died, there could not be anyone receiving the the benefits of that, and that's why he had to die before he created the world. Like we okay. read in Re Revelation 13, he's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Otherwise, Abel, for example, who was uh, the first true believer that we read about in the Bible, that we know to be a true believer, he could not have become saved unless the uh, maker of the will had died and that is Christ and neither could Moses become saved if Christ had not died before the foundation of the world and neither could Enoch uh, uh, be translated into heaven and neither could Abraham become saved and nobody else if, if, it, if, if he didn't die to pay for sins until 33 A.D. when he went to the cross. That was only a demonstration. He had to die right from before he ever created the world. Otherwise, there would be no salvation possible until he did die. Right. I, I, I got that. I understand that. I just thought the fact that he's resurrected means it doesn't negate, it doesn't negate the, the death issue. He, I just... He died once, and that did it, and, and that paid the price. 
Okay, um, I just have a couple of scriptures. Would you please read Isaiah 48, 12? What is your question now? Isaiah 48, 12. Let's look, take a look at that. Isaiah 48, 12. Isaiah 48, 12. There we read, uh, Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first. I also the last. Now, what is your question? Oh, hold on. We'll take a message. We have a caller who's asked a question about or wants us to look at Isaiah 48, verse 12. Hearken to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. Now, what is your question? In reference to Matthew 20, verse 16, where it says, So the last shall be first and the first last with regard to... Uh, excuse me, that is unrelated to this verse. Uh, yeah, that's regard to salvation. Um, I, I'm sorry, know? excuse me, excuse me. In Matthew 20, verse 16, where God is saying the last shall be first, he's talking, the context shows that, and that verse is found in several places. It has to do with those who hear the gospel, uh, the last people to hear it. And they are, right now today, about two-thirds of the world uh, has never heard from the Bible at all. They are the last. Now they are hearing from the Bible. And many of them are becoming saved, whereas there are uh, people who have been in the churches for all their life. They are the first, and uh, and yet they are not listening to the Bible at all the way they should, and they are the last. That is, they will end up at Judgment Day. Now, when God talks about He is the first and the last, He is emphasizing that he is from eternity past and goes on to eternity future. In the book of Revelation, uh, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first uh, letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, Again, underscoring that he is before all things and continues forever, ever in the future. And it's not related to... The last shall be first and the first last. Okay, but the part I don't understand, Mr. Camping, is how do we know from Scripture that the first who now become last will be left behind on the day of the catching up? Well, excuse me, the, 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 uh, we learn not j- just because a word, uh, a word can be used in in uh, in uh, a Very number easy. of different excuse me in a number of different situations, and just because it's the same word, that doesn't mean that necessarily it is talking about the same thing at all. It uh, we have to look at the context very carefully, and when the God is talking about the last shall be first and the first shall be last, the context again and again is showing that it has to do with those who are hearing the gospel, whereas when it it talks about Christ being first and last, as we find in a number of places, particularly in Revelation and here in Isaiah 48, it has nothing to do with with that other passage of the last shall be first and the first shall be last. We have to examine the context very carefully. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yeah. I was curious. You said uh, the Lord died before the foundation of the world. How did he die? Where does this tell us that? Or well, how did he die? He was. Uh, that's a, a divine mystery. When we talk about God, what can we know about God, that infinite Creator? He spoke and brought this fantastically complex world with all of its millions of life forms into existence. We can't possibly understand uh, God. And yet God ensures us that all the work of salvation was completed before he ever created the world. And uh, and uh, it was completed bef- uh, 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 so that it would be available, the results of his work, 
would be available as soon as sin entered. That's why Abel could become saved. He was the son of Adam and Eve. He already could be saved. Uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, again, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So his blood had to be shed before Abel was born. Otherwise, Abel could never have become saved. Now, how that would happen, how could God, because Christ is eternal God, uh, how could he be laden with the sins of all those who he had come had planned to save? Uh, God, of course, knows the end from the beginning. Uh, he, know, he, knew, he knows every one of the billions of people that would ever be born in the, in, the, in the world. He knew every sin that they would commit when they came into this world. And he named those that he, he, who he planned to save. And he took their sins, which they had not committed as yet because they hadn't even been born. It was before he ever even created the world and laid them on the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus was guilty, and he had to die. Now, how did that happen? How could God die? And he had to be buried. How could that be? We have no idea. We have no idea, but we know that the Bible reports that he did that. And that's because we don't, we, we just know that God is God. And and we just trust what he tells us. It's always true. And then he r r rose from the grave uh, before he ever created the world. And now he is the uh, he who made the law, uh, made the will uh, uh, that has to do with salvation, had died and rose again, uh, had died. And so therefore the uh, will became effective and the blood had been shed so that there could be forgiveness of sins. Everything was in order. The day that Adam and Eve sinned, it all, all the preparation for salvation had been completely made, and, and uh, there was nothing more that had to be done except that as each individual God had chosen came to whatever age God wanted to do it, whether as a baby or as an an hour before he died or any place in between he had to give him a new eternal soul to prepare him uh, for uh, living with Christ forevermore in heaven and he new earth and he made the commitment to that individual that on the, at the end of time May 21, 2011 he would also give that person a brand new eternal body well, how about um, to come out of the churches? Can you just tell me the scripture reference that I can look up and understand um, that we're not supposed to be in church? Because I don't want to be there if that's not what we're supposed to do. Well, I would suggest Family Radio has written a book called The End of the Church Age and After. It's available free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. It's postage paid. And, uh, and if you call or write Family Radio and call and ask for the book the end of the church age and after and uh, and it will be immediately sent to you all right sir thank you very much sir thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum oh hi harold camping i just shut my radio um i have two quick questions one uh, the other day i was listening to your bible study and you referred to ne the book of nahum and, but on the top of my Bible, it says the destruction of Nineveh. Could you explain that? Well, the, the, in Nahum, it's talking about the destruction of Nineveh. That's a different Nineveh. Okay. Uh, it is at a different time altogether. In Nahum, it represents the whole world. Okay, so they're really talking about end times. When you read the book of Nahum, all that sounds like the wrath of God. Is that true? It's talking about the uh, the wrath of God. Yes, coming. Okay, it is, it is from Ed Antoine. Okay, my second question to you is, finding it very difficult to talk to family members about. See, I get all emotional. I get all choked up because you love your mother, you love your sisters, you know that they're not true believers. And what do you do? I'm asking you personally, what do you do for family members or people who are very close to you, church people who you're very close to? 
What the Bible, did you do? The, the Bible is very, very knowledgeable of this. This is a situation that every true believer faces. Okay. I face it. Everyone faces it. We have loved ones that we dearly love. And we just weep in our souls when we realize that they don't want to talk about these things uh, because they are trusting their church or trusting uh, their pastor or whatever. And uh, and we know that they're going if they, if something doesn't happen to them, they're going to enter into the day of judgment. How horrible! But God does give us this much relief. Okay, we can't talk to them. They don't want to hear. They walk out of the room or they get angry. And so it, we we don't press them at all. But we can pray for them. God encourages us to beseech the Lord on their behalf, to beg the Lord. Oh, Lord, could my dear mother also become a, chi- a child of God before it, it's too late? Could my... Uh, dear son or daughter and brother or sister and so on and we can pray and pray and pray and maybe God in his mercy will still have uh, still open their spiritual eyes before it's too late I absolutely do that I just feel like I always feel like it's happened from the Holy Spirit that I'm not giving them the track so I'm not saying it again but I know that I said it already but you get to the point you don't want to start an argument you really want to keep your peace, and that's where I struggle because I'm so well, choked up. Don't, so upset. Remember, we can't argue anybody uh, we were into the kingdom of God. We we are so disturbed about this. We we just can't sleep when we think about it. But we have to restrain ourselves. There's no value in just beating on them. Uh, there's no value. God has to open their eyes, and that's why prayer is the big relief. And we have to remember that God is in charge. He knows what he is doing, and he does everything perfectly. And what he has done perfectly doesn't necessarily agree with what we think would be perfect. And so we finally have to leave it in God's hands and, and uh, know that, uh, that uh, uh, God's, um, God's will is a perfect will, uh, uh, whatever happens, even though it means that in, there's a good likelihood that our, these loved ones we're so concerned about will enter into the day of judgment. But we, but we have to be remember that God is completely in charge and we don't want to end up trying to dictate to God or insisting on something that God has not planned but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello Mr. Camping yes okay I've been trying to get you forever but (laughs) finally got through we got got a lot of questions but I'm going to narrow it down to Revelation chapter 3, um, verse 7 through 13. Let's look at that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. There we read, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and and uh, are not, but uh, uh, but uh, but are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of testing or temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold thou fast which thou hast, 
and that no man take away thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He, hath, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, what is your question? Well, it um, it's centers on uh, verse 9, where it talks about the synagogue of Satan. Yes. Now, um, I, when I look at the Church of Philadelphia, I, I don't see what you see. I see um, a church that God's looking upon as good. But you're saying uh, about, you know, verse 9, where it's talking about their... Uh, the synagogue of Satan, where their, um, which the uh, Jews are not, and where basically they're worshiping before well, you. Well, excuse me. Now yeah. we 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 read about the church in Philadelphia. It was one of the seven churches that was in existence at that time, and mm -hmm. God has better things to say about this church than any of the other six. Uh, and. Uh, but it was not it was already being threatened when he talks about the synagogue of satan it means all uh, there's already a warning that satan is going to be sowing tares there also it's uh, it's already a warning and uh, and there is no perfect church that has ever developed every church that uh, beginning with these seven churches the the next thing you remember you read in Galatians in chapter 1 that the churches of Galatia that they are following another gospel that that means that the synagogue of Satan has already been active there when it talks about that it means that there are people that are that are unsaved that have come into the church and so while God has a lot of nice things to say about the church he is already warning that Satan is on, is on the horizon. And don't think that he isn't going to be sowing tares there also after a bit. Right, right. Now, now it's no way that this could be in reference to meaning about the, the elect at the end that are being uh, caught up and that everybody's knees will bend because uh, they'll be knocked down to the ground, basically, from no. that earthquake that they're not worshiping no 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 no, no. it's this is simply giving us information of how the church age began uh this is very very important information uh we read in acts 2 that there were about 3000 who were saved that first day the day of pentecost in 33 AD we read uh a, f a few chapters later, about 5,000 who were saved. And so it looks pretty glorious, pretty glamorous. It looks like the church age is really going uh, in a wonderful way. But we have to read the whole Bible. And, uh, you know, the Bible was completed uh, uh, about uh, 60 years after, approximately 60 years after, the, whole, the church age began. And so within that 60-year period, we already find that God gives us the record of six churches that uh, Satan already is active there. Uh, one of the churches is ready to be vomited out because they're neither hot nor cold. Another church, he's ready to, uh, to uh, take the candlestick away from them because they've lost their first love. And even in the church at Philadelphia, the threat of Satan activity, which of course had already been been uh, uh, very active in the other six churches, is already ready to come in the church at Philadelphia. And uh, so that it wasn't long and every, every church in the world was permeated by terrors and uh, began to uh, bring uh, wrong doctrines uh, all together. And this has been the character of the church age for the, its whole period of time. And in the end of the church age, every church has become completely 
uh, off uh, off balance insofar as the truth of the Bible. They have come up with a do-it-yourself gospel. They believe that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. Things that very carefully, they very definitely assure them that they are going to be entering the day of judgment if they remain there. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, okay, Revelation 8, chapter 8. Uh, Revelation 8, verse? Um, from 6 to 13. The only thing, I have a question with that, and then I'll listen over the air. Um the seven angels are supposed to sound, but only four sound up to verse 12. And on each one of those scriptures where it says that they sounded, they only destroyed a third part of, you know, like the moon, the sun, the waters. Um, so can you explain that? And then it finishes on 13 where there were three more angels to sound, were yet to sound. If you yeah. can read the last chapter, yeah. Of the well, third, then okay? when you go, we have to go to Revelation nine, where the fifth angel sounded, and we continue and continue, and finally in Revelation ten, I believe the seventh angel sounded, or if I remember accurately, the sixth angel sounded in Revelation nine, verse thirteen, and uh, then finally a little later, the seventh angel sounded. Now, God is simply indicating that uh, God is opening up information for us by this kind of language. And the focal point in Revelation 8 is on the third part. And that is very ominous because God typified the true believers as one-third. In Zechariah chapter 13, uh, one-third are the ones that go... Uh, that have gone through the fire, that is, they have, their sins have been paid for by the Lord Jesus. But, but here it's talking about one third, one third, one third. It's interesting, you know, that in our day, in our day, when you read the, Al the World Almanac, and uh, uh, that is not the Bible, of course, but it's, at least they try their best to give accurate figures, and they're able to know how many people identify with churches that feature Christ, because every church keeps uh, 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 records of how many members they have, and and how many babies are born, and how many are they have a cradle roll, and they have a, how many make confession of faith, and so on, and uh, they calculate that about almost exactly one-third of the world's population today has some relationship with a church that features Christ. That's a truly an amazing piece of information because it is the third part that is going to, is being featured in, in Revelation 8 as being destroyed. Uh, one-third of the ships, one-third of this, one-third of that. It is a, a constantly addressing the number one-third, and it is the church age, or the churches at the end of the church age where we are, that are going to be entering into the day of judgment uh, because they have entirely the wrong gospel. They have a do-it-yourself gospel, and nobody can become saved by that kind of a gospel as well as many other doctrines that are contrary to the Word of God. Uh, for example, they do not understand that the whole Bible is word by word in the original language is written by God and other things. But especially, and, and remember we learned from 1 Thessalonians 5 that in the churches they believe that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, but they are all... Uh, safe and secure, they're in pay, peace and safety. And then remember in First Thessalonians 5, we have that terrible, terrible warning that sudden destruction will come upon them. 
and that means they're going to be entering into the day of judgment and it fits Revelation chapter 8 one third one third one third is destroyed is destroyed is destroyed but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello Harold Campy how are you doing tonight very well thank you um, before I, I have one statement to say, but before I get to that, um, the Occupy Until I Come can be found in Luke chapter 19, verse 13. It's Luke chapter 19, verse 13. Let's read that. Luke chapter 19. And I thank you for looking that up. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. 13, we read, uh, uh, and he called, a, a certain nobleman, verse 12, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he went into heaven, and uh, then, uh, uh, and then the kingdom of God would be developed throughout the church age and all the way uh, through the end of the day of of uh, the time of tribulation and then he would return and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them occupy till I come and so uh, this is a command it's a spiritual this is a parable of course but it's spiritually pointing to the fact that the true believers who have been given the gospel are to keep busy with the gospel yeah, getting it out into the world until Christ comes and so uh, we in Family Radio are taking that very very literally very seriously uh, that uh, we are to be busy uh, warning the world of Judgment Day and, uh, and uh, the wonderful fact that until Christ comes there is still the possibility of salvation. Maybe you still can become saved. And that will come to an end when, when we see the great earthquake that, in, that indicates the day of judgment has come. But thank you and the rapture of the believers that will be happening simultaneously. But shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Oh, my, we were, we're right up to the end of our program, and so we can't take any more calls. Again, I want to thank each of you for allowing me to come in and visit. I learn from you, as I hope you learn from me. And now I have to say good night. <laughs>